Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Curtis. I'm glad you're able to join us this Monday afternoon. Last week, right here, you would have seen President Cyril Ramaphosa telling the Zondo Commission of Inquiry that, in his view, it was wrong for the former chair of PRASA, Popo Molefe, to come to the ANC's top six leadership at the time and ask for help. Molefe had explained how he had tried to fight against corruption at the Paris Statel and that everyone who he asked for help simply ignored him. Popo Molefe is no longer the chair of PRASA. He's now the chair of Transnet, but he's agreed to speak to us in mainly in his position as chair of PRASA. He's in our studio now. Mr. Molefe, good evening, good afternoon to you, sir, and thank you so much for coming good in. Good afternoon, Stephen. Um, last <coughs> week, the president, the leader of the movement that you come from, the leader of the African National Congress, said that you should not have come to them for help, that you should have fought against the corruption of PRASA by yourself. How did you feel when you heard him say that? I was embarrassed, and uh, to say the least, uh, aggrieved, because he should have told me that when I was in a meeting with him on that particular day. He did not say so. He said they needed time to think about the issues I was raising with them. And that's all they said to me. And I said, look, I'm here to, to tell you that uh, as custodians of uh, the Constitution and the laws of the country, you have failed to discharge your responsibility. Perhaps you thought those mobilizing protests uh, and insulting the board were going to succeed and their campaign would therefore perhaps assist you to remove the board. Uh, yeah, and I said I have to, uh, I'm now going to act on those laws that you passed but are, not, are reluctant to defend public finance management be key in that regard. Of course, I had already started acting. As you know, we had already instituted investigations, both as a result of the Auditor General's findings and secondly, the, the then recently released report of uh, public protector, uh, Professor Tuli Madonzelo, as she was not professor at that time, of course, yeah. Um, what got you to the point where you went to the ANC's top six in the first place? What happened? And I mean, I remember, um, you and I were talking at the time, if I recall, um, I mean, you had asked the Hawks to investigate corruption at Prasa, and they had actually refused. Yes, they did. But, uh, you know, uh, Stephen, um, I've been a member of the ANC for many, many years, for close on to 50, uh, five decades now. And uh, I considered myself to be a loyal and disciplined member of the party. And if where I have been deployed, there are problems, it was proper that I share those problems with the leadership of the party, particularly because they were also the government of uh, the day. So it was very important. But also to say, look, here, I'm standing alone fighting. Organs of state are not even supporting me, you know. Um, as you know, I had to launch a mandamus application against the walks. And it was also surprising that people who have a constitutional uh, duty and mandate uh, to discharge their responsibilities towards South African society and the public in general were refusing literally to do their job. And instead, they, they apply to oppose my application and the basis upon which they were applying was reliant on the actions of the ministers of the ANC who made the board dysfunctional by encouraging some directors not to stay on the board to resign and also holding back the representatives of the Department of Transport and National Treasury who if uh, had been appointed as required by the legal transi transition to uh, legal succession to national transportation services would have meant that the, the board would have created. They did not want the board to function and nobody said anything. So you go to, so, so out of, in a way, a sense of duty as you describe it, I imagine to an extent a sense of frustration as well at one point. You go to the top leadership of your organization, as you say, an organization you've been a member of, played an immense role for, if I may say, um, for 50 years, and you get no support after that. I can't imagine how you felt. 
No, I really felt devastated, uh, embarrassed and depressed, I must say, by, by what I experienced. But I remained a fighter because I believed in the ethics and values that the movement had taught me and uh, believed in. And I upheld those values and uh, I was not going to allow anybody to detract me from the cause of ensuring that uh, we cleaned up the corruption that was there. It must have been very difficult. I mean, there you were, as Advocate Bastoni put it, <coughs> testifying. I mean, he was putting questions to President Ramaphosa. You were left on your own during this time. Certainly, it is so. Um, I remember some of my comrades um, who subsequently came back to, to apologize and uh, congratulate me for standing my ground. We're saying at the time, Comrade Popo, we, we think that you have started something that you cannot sustain, a battle that you're going to lose. Um, mm. uh, maybe we need to talk about how you should deal with this thing. Um, but I would, I would hear nothing about that because it was correct to fight. So, I mean, people basically thought the forces against them were too strong, against you were too strong. Well, they did, and indeed they were. But I think at that time, those in, in top positions knew the vast arsenal I had, which called upon any time to deploy, I would have deployed against them uh, to devastating effect. Um, so that's why, whilst they were not really doing anything, they wouldn't go out openly attacking me as the leadership. In a way, your story gets to the heart of how power works in South Africa. So we're supposed to have parastatals with independent boards. The boards get appointed by cabinet, there's the sort of famous statement at the end, famous comment at the end of every cabinet statement every two weeks that says these appointments are made and then it says in brackets subject to checks on their qualifications and then the appointments are made. But after that, they're supposed to operate independently and yet we know from the evidence at the Zondo Commission and we knew before that there was a deployment committee at the ANC, that the, cabin, that the, that the boards are not necessarily independent. Um, what do you think we've learned about that from the Zondo Commission that maybe needs to change? Uh, yeah, well, uh, Stephen, maybe before I come to that, we must debunk the myth that uh, the boards, I suppose, are independent. Mm. The boards of state-owned entities are not independent. The legal succession to National Transportation Services Act require that when a group CEO is appointed, the minister be consulted. The minister, uh, advised by the deployment committee of the party, insist on having three names, which presupposes that if the board has a preferred candidate, they reserve the right to change uh, that and put in the candidate that they want, despite the fact that they would not have participated in the process of interviewing the applicants, which is wrong. Secondly, that that law itself, contrary to the provisions of the Companies Act, I think is probably Section 13 of the Companies Act that says uh, the board of directors are the ultimate authority of the company. They limit that authority by putting in the shareholders compact or, or board charters or memorandum of memoranda of incorporation provisions which take away the powers of the board. So the story that I had all the instrument necessary to do what I could do is not true because I, we would not even have gone to the minister about the appointment of the group CEO. We would not have waited fighting for so many years trying to get them to agree with us on the candidate that we had selected. Uh, I think the difficulty with the, our leadership is that in their uh, desire to, to hold on to power, to demonstrate that they are in charge, they make p policy decisions that when they are challenged in public, they cannot defend publicly. 
Uh, they now start obfuscating, looking for fall, uh, the people they could make their fall boys and fall girls, which is what we're trying to do. So this whole thing needs to change. This I mean whole thing needs to change. Uh, f but after experiencing what we saw at Prasa and what we saw at Transnet, what we got there, we made a detailed submission to the Zondo Commission under my signature. Because we tell the first phase was to say, what did we find when we got into Transnet? The second phase was to say, now that we have found all of these uh, malfeasances, uh, transgressions, what is our response? What should be done? And uh, that last submission uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, responds to that. And one of the things that it deals with is issues of governance, uh, including this thing that uh, politicians would interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of the board, including operations of, of management. It's a submission that we're making, and we say if you want to end corruption, you must uh, move away from that. If we didn't have those things, you would, you would not have had a situation where ministers could impose the CEOs that they want or the CFOs they wanted for state-owned companies. Nor could they have been able to impose board of directors. Of course, maybe board of directors because it's their prerogative as representatives of the shareholders to appoint the board. Maybe that one, there's very little that could be done about. Um, the whole idea of the ANC Deployment Committee, which is the whole issue of deployments at the root of this thing. And I mean, I understand it's very controversial. There are arguments that go both ways. Do you think the Deployment Committee should still exist then? Should the whole, I mean, you say the whole system should change? Would you go as far as saying there shouldn't be a deployment committee? No, Stephen, uh, deployment was a critical uh, strategic consideration when we took government in 1990, when we began reflecting on this matter as early as 1991, mm. when we adopted the new strategy and tactics of the ANC uh, at the conference that was held at uh, Tequini in, uh, in, in, in KwaZulu Natal, in Natal at the time. Mm. And it was necessary because here we, uh, we were, we were fighting a party system, that apartheid system uh, had uh, relied on white civil servants, largely, largely Africana and male, mm. who were steeped in this ethos of apartheid. If you were transforming the country, you had to tamper that with uh, an element of uh, mm. progressive uh, mentality, element of uh, uh, commitment to transformation. So we had to look for the best people who would discharge that. And even at that time, the idea was not to appoint uh, members of the ANC exclusively. Uh, we understood that we needed to look into our ranks as to where are the people we trained over the years who have the qualifications. Thereafter to say where are and who are committed South African patriots, black and white, who could be deployed to change the apartheid set up. You know, we had many white Democrats mm. who, who, who turned their backs against apartheid and fought side by side with us, who were there at the time when apartheid was collapsing. So we needed to continue with them to increase our numbers and consolidate our efforts to, to change the apartheid system. But of course, we, we, we didn't have enough numbers at the time but it was necessary to do so. But even then, it was not a question of the ANC just picking an individual and say, you're going to become this, to become that. Mm. It would identify several people and say there are these vacancies, apply. They would go through a proper process of interview. They would still be required to perform in the mm. interview to justify any appointment that, that would come as a consequence of that, yeah. We've seen the test. So what am I saying? Uh, that I'm saying the deployment is mm. not a bad idea. Mm. It, it is necessary. It is applied elsewhere. 
but it changed along the way from being a deployment based on skill, on qualifications and commitment to transformation and building uh, what we now call capable state mm. to becoming a deployment of cronies, pliable individuals who would just do uh, what they are being ordered to do regardless of whether it is right or wrong. Mm. Uh, that's where we lost it. And to the extent that that is how we're doing it, perhaps it's time for it to go. At the start of this conversation, um, you used a very polite English word. You used the word aggrieved when I asked you how you felt when the president basically said last week that you shouldn't have asked him and the other members of the ANC's top six as it then was. I mean, Jacob Zuma was the president at the time. He would have been a member of the top six when you asked them for help. Um, Vassoni, Advocate Vassoni, who, who studied the Prasa evidence leader for, for the Zondo Commission, possibly knows more about what happened in terms of studying it forensically than anyone alive apart from maybe yourself. Um, he, he, he said you'd basically been left alone. That was his question to the president. Do you know why the president answered in the way that he did when he basically said that you'd done the wrong thing, not him? I, I, I think the president was in serious trouble in serious trouble because under the presidency of uh, President Zuma, he never had the courage to challenge wrong things that, uh, that were happening at the time. And he was scared to say openly that, I'm sorry, I had this president and I was afraid to challenge you. So he looked for a fall boy and uh, you would have seen many answers he was genuinely evasive and obfuscating, you know, uh, that was, that, that was the, the, the problem with him. I mean, if anybody had to say somebody is disingenuous, that word should have been applied to him, not to me. Do you think he did the right thing by staying on as deputy president? Well it, has, it, well, it has paid a dividend. It's complicated, yeah. It, it has paid a dividend, but uh, we must see uh, the result of it because now he's at the helm of uh, uh, power and authority. He's in charge now. He has to use that to achieve what he could not achieve when he was um, subordinate to President Zuma. Uh, I think there's still a lot of reluctance. Uh, he takes too long to make decisions. And in, in the interim, a lot of damage kept caused. Um, I have made example of the many whistleblowers who, who have suffered for blowing the whistle. Uh, him and his cabinet and the ANC as a party have the powers and authority to protect those individuals, to say these individuals lost their jobs because they blew the whistle. That is unfair. It's unjust. Now that we are in charge, let them go back uh, to serve the South Africans. Even if they don't go back to exactly the same positions they held, but there has to be a way in which we recognize the very important role that they played in, in exposing corruption and in putting their lines and careers on the line. Uh, it's very important that we do that. That is not happening. I have brought back a couple of people who were treated like that in, in, in Transnet. And of course, some of them uh, were being subjected to efforts uh, at elimination, uh, you know, by heat squads. Uh, but we have done it, and uh, I think the challenge is still there, that it must be done. That those boards who come in and behave like the Gupta uh, appointed uh, and loyal boards should stop that kind of a conduct. But you still see some boards doing that, and nobody is acting against them. I still want to understand why. I mean, some... some uh, uh, Transnet executives were asked by the State Capture Commission to, gov to come and, and make submissions of evidence. And then before they gave the evidence, they, the letters were written to say they've got no 
permission to give <laughs> evidence at the, at the State Capture Commission. The president says, uh, support, we support the commission. The ANC make that public statement. But then somebody who's appointed by the ANC and the government of the ANC frustrate this effort and nobody says anything. Sure. Um, the person who was in charge of government at the time and in charge of the ANC when all of this happened was former President Jacob Zuma. He's currently unwell. We don't know the, the exact nature of his condition, nor should we. <coughs> but he's, <coughs> bless you, he's unwell. Um, he is in prison at the moment, actually in a hospital at the moment. How do you feel towards him now? Well, look, uh, I, I, I don't hold grudges. Uh, it is said that uh, he has landed in a situation in which he is. I like what Mondli Makanya says in his article over this weekend in the City Press, that perhaps uh, all that President Zuma should have done is to go to the State Capture Commission and be as evasive as other witnesses, including his uh, successor, uh, did. Uh, he would have gotten away with going to jail, <laughs> even if he might not have fully answered the question. Uh, uh, maybe that's uh, in hindsight uh, what he should have done. So I, I, I feel sorry for him. Um, he, he has been my leader, but my attitude has always been that your title in office is not going to make me... Uh, uh, just follow you blindly what you are saying. When you hold an office, uh, that high office, you must demonstrate first and foremost to me that uh, you got jealously uh, against our values, uh, the ethics and the morality of uh, the African National Congress or those principles that underpin a, a functioning democratic system. So I'm the kind of a person who would not do things because I want to save my skin. I failed to try and save my skin in the days of apartheid. Um, I faced a trial where I could have been sentenced to death in the Delmas treason trial. Uh, but we stood our ground in that regard. Uh, we refused to say to South Africans that the ANC was a terrorist organization that Mandela and uh, Oliver Tambo were terrorist leaders. We said, look, uh, these are leaders respected by the South Africans. Yeah. you got to talk to them if you want to find solutions to this country's problems. So we don't want to save our skins by avoiding to face the truth. Mr. Malefe, there are one or two other subjects I'm going to try and sneak under your radar, if I may, this afternoon. Um, it seems that Professor Job Mokoro was going to resign, perhaps as early as this week, as Premier of North West. If I remember correctly, you actually appointed him. You worked with him a long time ago when you became Premier in that province. Um, your thoughts? I mean, should he stay on as Premier, do you think? The political situation there is very complicated. I think you're correct, Stephen. The political situation is complicated there. I don't know what uh, Professor Mukoro might have done. But I know that uh, he has been a, uh, a consummate uh, public servant. Uh, you would recall that when Buputazona collapsed and there was no government there, him and Professor Charles van der Waalt were appointed as joint administrators. Uh, late, a month later, I came in as the premier and I appointed him, uh, the Director General. And Charles van der Waalt, I appointed as one of my advisors uh, as we bought the new government. Professor Mukhoro is a well-trained civil servant. In fact, he was involved in the, the, the program to, to build, to create, train, and develop the, 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 the South African New Public Service for South Africa with Professor Sangweni and Professor uh, Sbu, uh, uh, the, the Vice Chancellor of uh, the University of Pretoria. I don't know if he's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, people like uh, Sandy Lenoklina, mm -hmm. uh, Paseka Ncholo, uh, and, and Paul Daphne, some of us, we work together to prepare 
for the creation of the new public service. And he served the Northwest uh, with distinction until he was called by President Mbeki to go and help at the national government. Uh, I don't know what happened when he was sent back to the Northwest, what he did, uh, and I can't uh, vouch for anything. Uh, in my discussions with him, the sense I got was that uh, uh, his problems were, were the typical factional, of course, by typical factional fights within the, the governing party. Um, and then Transnet, which you're currently the chair of. You had a virtual press conference today with the Minister of Public Enterprises, Pravin Gordon. There were conversations around infrastructure. You need private parties to help with the rehabilitation of some infrastructure, if I understood that correctly. That, that is correct, uh, Stephen. We, we need the private sector to come to the party. Um, the government has been downgraded so many times, so have the state-owned entities. There's simply no money. Mm. Uh, Money is expensive on the uh, international markets. Uh, we have to start with the money that is at home. And there are many uh, companies that are willing to work with us, both here and abroad, to invest in the infrastructure and to partner with Transnet. We think that is a creative way of ensuring that we, we make Transnet sustainable under very difficult uh, conditions. Is this privatization? It's not privatization. You sure? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, it's not typical privatization. It is, uh, we are continuing to hold the assets under the state-owned companies. But on a project-by-project -project basis, we partner with the private sector because both of us will then put money into that and both of us will, will, will reap the upside of what we invest in. T to the extent that it becomes necessary to concession set certain project as has been done in any event over the years by Transnet, we would do so. Um, and we would also partner with them in, the, in rail uh, businesses. We are facing this big challenge uh, of, uh, of cable theft, the theft of rails and so on. So we are together with the private sector creating uh, a fund uh, that would enable our security fund that would enable us to fund activities uh, geared towards defeating uh, the, the plans to, to cripple Transnet by, you know, the rampant, uh, through, through rampant uh, corruption and, uh, and theft of, uh, of cable. Mr. Popo Molefe, sir, thank you for coming in. Thank you for coming into our studios and for taking the trouble. I really appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Stephen. Popo Molefe is, of course, the chair of Transnet. Uh, for most of that interview, of course, discussing his experience at Prasa. In a moment, our business editor, Kolani Mbandre, will also have an insider's look.